Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, the 22nd of September and week three of Earth Laws Month, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a moment. My name is Michelle Maloney. I'm the co-founder and national convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. Um, and it's my great pleasure to um, bring Chris Wright to us today to give a talk about some of his amazing photography um, and his interests in showing this, as he calls it, the paradox of some of the nastier things we've managed to do to our planet. Um, and by using the power of photography and the power of arts and communication, um, letting people see these things with either new eyes or for the first time. But first I'd like to um, open up by acknowledging country and I have got some slides if all goes well. I had a few hiccups a minute ago. Anything could happen. There we go. So yes, we're excited to have you join us today um, for a discussion with Chris and we'll introduce Chris in a moment. Earth Laws Month is um, Ayla's we little gathering of amazing people and discussions and events throughout September. We held our first Earth Laws Month last year. Uh, we had more than 40 events and we decided that was a little bit crazy, but a lot of fun. This year we we're having around 20 events where we've invited people doing amazing things to speak about and care for the environment from indigenous knowledge holders, scientists, economists, lawyers, doctors, medicine, medicine doctors, doctors of medicine, um, and many others. So in a moment, I'll just remind you uh, that there are a whole bunch of events on next week that you may be interested in. And all of our events uh, are recorded and you'll be able to find webinars, discussions, arts uh, displays, and a whole bunch of other things on that website. I would like to acknowledge country. I like to acknowledge that I live, work and play on the unceded lands of the Cubby Cubby and Jinnaburra traditional custodians. So I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present and emerging leaders, young people and communities who are continuing to care for country and care for each other. For those who don't know, this place is actually in a beautiful patch of Southeast Queensland. Um, it's becoming quite a Zoom tradition to ask folks if they would like to acknowledge country uh, or jot down in the chat uh, where you are, what you're up to today. It's really nice to read uh, all the different places where you are. So please feel free to pop your thoughts into the chat. And as I said before, also any questions you might have can go in the chat. Before we hand over to Chris and sit back and enjoy his talk and uh, hopefully some great images, I just want to give a plug for some other amazing human beings next week. Um, on Monday, for the first time ever, Ayla is delighted to have a doctor of medicine, not a medicine doctor. I think there are different connotations to that framing. Um, Dimity Williams is part of Doctors for the Environment, and she's just released a book earlier this year called Nature, Our Medicine how the natural world sustains us. And I really want to plug this because um, it's as if Western science is finally catching up uh, and the medical profession too, uh, on how powerful and important time for human beings in the rest of nature is, uh, is for us. So I think that's going to be a terrific discussion. The EDO Australia, uh, Australia's biggest environmental law group, um, are going to be giving a talk about the right to a healthy environment. We've got an all day extravaganza. It's a real rights of nature symposium marathon on Thursday. If you're interested in what's going on in Spain, Ecuador, Colombia, Mexico, Philippines, India, lots of good things, um, register for the event. You can always pop back in and watch the recordings or join us live all day on the 28th of September. And as a little break in between, we had already arranged for a webinar with Jojo Meta about Ecoside um, and what's going on in the international uh, space around that. And finally, last but not least, on the last day of Earth Laws Month, we've got an amazing group of people from lots of different faith backgrounds talking about faith and the environment and a whole bunch of different movements and projects and actions that um, wonderful Australians are involved in. So that is probably enough from me by way of walking advertisement for Earth Laws Month. Um, we do hope that if you're new to AILA, please check out our website. Sarah Bashforth, who I acknowledge too, one of my colleagues and I will put a few links in there for you all to check out. All our events are free, um, so please get involved. So without further ado, Mr. Wright, how are you today? I'm good, thanks very much, Michelle. That's great. We were really pleased that you agreed when we invited you to come and give a talk about your work, Sublime Toxics. Um, so over to you and um, we will keep an eye on questions for you. Thanks, Chris. 
Okay, thanks very much. Uh, and thanks everybody for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm speaking from Gadigal Lands of the Eora Nation uh, in Sydney. Uh, and what I'm going to present for you today is, is a bit of a different talk for me because uh, my background, I'm a professor of organization studies at the University of Sydney in a business school. And for the last 15 years or so, I've been studying climate change and the role of corporations and in industry and in exacerbating that or obfuscating that. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is essentially something different. It's really sort of an attempt for me to bring my personal interests in photography and visual imagery and combine it with my research interests. And I'll give you a bit of background about that. But I'm going to share the screen now and um, show you the presentation. Okay, so um, yeah, it's uh, the, the the talk is entitled "The Toxic Sublime: A Photographic Exploration of Degraded Landscapes." And as I said, it's an attempt by me to try and weave together my academic research in the political economy of the climate crisis uh, with my personal interests in visual uh, imagery, visual communication, and photography in particular. And the background here is that. Um, earlier this year, I enrolled in a photography masterclass with the Centre for Contemporary Photography in Melbourne, which was taught by uh, a pretty well-known environmental photographer, Michaela Skovranova, who's worked with um, uh, National Geographic, um, New York Times, a whole lot of places. Um, and as part of this course, each of us participants, or about six of us, we had to develop our own photographic project over the, the six months of the course. And what you'll be seeing today essentially is um, parts of my final project for that course. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how that came about and what it's about. And that uh, that title image there is one of the images from the final cut of images, um, which is a, as you're probably trying to understand what it is, it's a very colourful, very patterned image. It's actually shot from a drone up in the air. We're about 50 metres above um, the Mannering Park coal ash ponds near Vowles Point Power Station and Lake Macquarie. Um, and you can see, um, yeah, it's it's symptomatic, I think, of the sort of imagery and themes I'm going to try and communicate, which I'll come to in a moment. Okay, so a little bit of background about me. As I said, about 15 years, I've been increasingly fixated on the worsening climate crisis, and it's become the major focus of my academic research. Uh, and this started about the time the Stern Report came out in the UK around 2006. Uh, and I was fascinated by the way in which uh, corporations, business uh, associations, politicians, the media sought to sort of obfuscate and inveigle around the, the key issue, what Al Gore so accurately termed uh, an inconvenient truth. That is that through two centuries of rapid economic development, globalization, mass consumption, global capitalism, um, that has been based upon the extraction and consumption of fossil energy, coal, oil and gas. And these fossil fuels have really define pretty much everything that we do now as a species on this planet. However, that addiction to fossil energy has come at a terrible price, as we're now realising, uh, by releasing essentially the carbon um, into the atmosphere that was sequestered deep in the earth for hundreds of millions of years. Um, the wealthy parts of humanity have basically changed the chemistry of the atmosphere and the oceans in pretty catastrophic ways. Uh, and we're now at a stage where we're threatening the very life support systems of the planet. And um, we're seeing those implications now, of course, in real time. This is a shot from the Black Summer, of course, in um, late 2019, early 2020. I think this is a shot looking across at Mount Solitary in the Blue Mountains. And you can see it all engulfed in flame. And we're seeing this around the world, the Northern Hemisphere, some of it's just passed, worsening storms, floods, fires, droughts, heat waves, you name it. Um, but it was not like we weren't warned, or at least our corporate and political masters weren't warned about what was happening. The science of anthropogenic climate disruption is well over a century and a half old. Um, as far back as the 1960s, US presidents were receiving memos from the chiefs of staff about the greenhouse effect and how serious it was. In the 1970s, Exxon, the one of the world's largest oil companies, their own internal research scientists, uh, were presciently graphing future atmospheric carbon concentrations and global temperature rise on a business as usual trajectory. And ominously back in 1980, 40 years later, they predicted that by 2020, the world would reach 420 parts per million atmospheric carbon dioxide and about over a degree of warming and they were bang on the money. And yet the response to those prescient warnings from the 1950s, 60s and 70s 
uh, was the creation of, of an industry of organised climate denial. And this has been well documented, um, the way in which big oil companies and fossil fuel companies and their industry associations created this um, this public relations uh, strategy of attacking scientists, denying the science, the reality of climate change and maintaining business as usual at all costs. And that conundrum formed the basis for our first book in 2015. Daniel Nyberg and I tried to answer this question, but Elizabeth Colbert, American journalist, very you know, cogently put forward, how could it be that a technologically advanced society could choose in essence to destroy itself? How and why does that happen? And that was really what we were trying to get at in that book in 2015. And we came up with this concept of creative self-destruction um, where innovative capacity was being focused at exactly the wrong things, more coal, more, coal, more oil, more gas. In the years since, um, I've been researching and publishing pretty widely on the political economy of climate change. This is our most recent book that came out in 2022, late last year. Uh, and it further develops the idea of this, what we call fossil fuel hegemony, the dominance of fossil energy and how that's maintained politically and economically, uh, how our politics has really been captured by um, these vested interests. But, 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 there's another part to my life um, which is very different. And um, it's based upon, I guess, embracing the natural world and the beauty of nature, which is almost the antithesis of what I, I've been studying. And I tend to do that through photography. Um, and so here's, here's a sort of a emblematic image. Many of you will recognize where this is. This is Bombo Quarry near Kiama on the south coast of New South Wales. Um, I'm a very keen landscape and nature photographer. And in doing this, I'm focused very much on trying to capture what could be termed the natural sublime. That is the way we are emotionally affected by the power, the vastness, the magnitude, the magnificence of nature. Um, so much of my work focuses on seascapes, mountain ranges, forests, waterfalls of epic scale and grandeur, very much in that tradition of the sort of the landscape photography of old, the masters like Ansel Adams, of course, um, or more contemporary examples like Mark Adamus uh, in the US. Uh, and there's clearly something of a disjuncture here, which I've recognized between my personal interests and my professional concerns. On the one side, there's the beauty of nature and natural ecosystems. On the other side, there's capitalist destruction of the planet and life on the planet. So for some time, I've been searching for ways to link my academic and um, photographic and visual interests. So one way I have been doing it in the past has been capturing images of fossil fuel extraction and use. So images of, for instance, coal loading facilities. This is a shot of the what uh, environmental activists might call the wheels of death. These are the big coal loading um, cranes at Kurigang Island in Newcastle, the world's largest coal port. This was a shot I took on a late summer's day. I was up at Newcastle for a research meeting and I was shooting through the chain wire fence of Kurigang Island. And as I took these shots, the security people turned up with flashing lights saying, what are you doing? And I said, I'm taking photos of industrial aesthetics and they seemed okay with that, but they weren't wild about the suggestion of maybe putting a drone up, that was a definite no-no. Um, so yeah, you can take these, these almost sort of cliched shots, I guess, of big industrial infrastructure. Here's another one. This is a shot of Vales Point Power Station in the distance um, across Lake Macquarie, shot at sunset, long exposure. It's very beautiful. Um, again, there's a sort of juxtaposition of beauty and what's actually in the background, which is a big coal-fired power station. So one of the limitations, I guess, of trying to visually represent fossil fuels and climate change is to get behind the stereotypical images of smokestacks and find compositions that are to some extent novel or striking or different or create thought amongst those who are viewing it. You know, what's going on here? What's this about sort of thing? And so with this in mind, for that photographic course that I was doing, I decided to take a, a different path and put aside the conventional handheld camera and see if I could get a different perspective from the air. I was aware of um, photographers, landscape photographers who do a lot of aerial photography. They hire small planes, Cessnas, and they get up at altitude and they photograph um, natural landscapes, you know, river courses and things, lakes, Lake Eyre is an obvious example. But also um, uh, other photographers, Paul, Paul Holland is a friend of mine, Tas very famous Tasmanian landscape photographer. And he did a book with uh, some other photographers uh, called Black and Blue, um, which is an aerial photographic um, 
depiction of the contradiction of the Great Barrier Reef and bleaching on the reef and the coal mines and the Bowen, Bowen Basin and Galilee Basin nearby. And it's a very powerful evocative book of uh, contrasting those two things. So I thought I was sort of influenced by that. I was also influenced by the work of um, some environmental photographers in the US and Canada who've used aerial photography um, to capture large industrial sites. Um, uh, and there's a number of those. So um, that's what I was sort of influenced by. Uh, I was also interested in trying to capture the scale of fossil energy, which is very hard to capture from the ground. Uh, and this paradoxical, paradoxical relationship we have with it. We depend on fossil energy to provide power. In Australia, we still use around, uh, I think it's around 60, 60 to 70 percent, depending on the day of our electricity comes from coal fired uh, power generation. Um, some of us in the community worship fossil energy, uh, the National Party, the advertisements on television for the little black rock, coal is a wonder mineral, um, and yet it's killing us. That's the paradox. It's killing life on the planet. It's endangering the future of our civilization. It's destroying ecosystems. It's altering the web of life on the planet. Um, coal, oil, and gas, hydrocarbon energy uh, is a death sentence for much of the life on this planet. So this is the photo project, and you don't have to read all this text, but it's called Toxic Sublime, and I'm using drones, um, taking photos from the air to explore the toxic legacies of coal-fired power generation. So it's not so much on the actual generation facilities, it's this specific sort of aspect of it, which is the waste that comes from when you burn the coal. You have all this coal ash as residue, um, it's, it's combusting the power plant, but what do you do with all this coal ash? And basically in Australia and many parts of the world, it's pumped into these huge storage containment dams adjacent to the power plants. And the coal contains naturally trace elements and toxins, um, but after combustion, those toxins are concentrated. Substances such as arsenic, cadmium, lead, mercury, radium, selenium, chromium. Um, many of the country's coal ash dumps or waste sites uh, were built uh, before modern pollution regulations were put in place. So um, uh, many of the coal uh, power plants were built in the 60s and 70s. This is Bayswater power plant. This was built in 1985. It's a bit more recent, um, but you can still see there's a substantial coal waste um, site there. Um, and these toxins and pollutants, which are concentrated in the coal ash, can leach into the groundwater. Uh, they can become airborne in strong winds. They're not capped. They're not lined. So uh, there is a pollution impact for those in the vicinity. And nearby communities bear the brunt of that toxic legacy as the older coal-fired power stations are closed down in um, transition to renewable energy. There's a lot of questions remaining about how will these sites be remediated? Who will pay for them? Who will clean up uh, this mess? That basically 50, 60 years of um, coal-fired power waste. Now, before I started this photo project, I was pretty ignorant about the huge problem that waste coal is. Um, for instance, Australia's coal-fired power stations produce as much as 12 million tonnes of coal each year, which is the equivalent of 500 kilos for every Australian per annum. Uh, and coal ash has been described as Australia's biggest waste problem, yet you rarely hear about it. In fact, uh, I'm pretty well versed in the issues of climate and energy and pollutants resulting from that. And I was sort of aware of coal ash, but not the scale and the consequences of it. And in the US and other countries where coal-fired power is even more prevalent, um, there have been really significant pollution disasters. Um, very famous one that you can find on YouTube and online is the famous Little Blue Run Lake in Pennsylvania, uh, which was an old coal ash um, reservoir that was flooded and created this bizarre, as you can see, aqua blue lake which was marketed over there at the time for nearby communities as like a sort of little bit of paradise, a little bit of Bermuda. Um, in fact, a highly toxic um, waste lake uh, and led to um, pretty significant controversy, television documentaries, etc. Again, for context, here's a map of locations of existing coal ash dumps on the left. Um, you can see they're mostly on the East Coast, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, where most of our coal-fired power stations are, a little bit in WA. Uh, and then on the right is a Google Maps shot of the three sites that I concentrated for this project, essentially around Lake Macquarie, um, uh, Vales Point and Araring Power Stations, and then up in the Hunter, Upper Hunter, we've got um, uh, Bayswater and Liddell Power Stations. Uh, so those were the areas I was sort of concentrating on. 
And again, as a final point of context, just to talk about how the photos were created before I actually get to the photos, it was not easy. Um, coal power plants and coal mines that feed them are invariably very large areas of land. They're very much hidden from public view. It's actually quite hard to see them from roadways and freeways. Uh, they're also restricted areas. They're protected behind extensive exclusion zones, berms and security fences for good reason. Um, you don't want to be wandering around a coal ash waste site um, because of the toxic nature of the site. Um, it's a dangerous place. And so aerial photography is the only way to really capture those images. And lacking the resources of a chartered plane, um, I decided to use uh, just a consumer drone that I have, a DJI Mavic Pro 2, um, to attempt to capture these images. And to get the images, obviously, I had to take off from public land. I can't trespass onto private spaces. So I had to find access points from public lands and roads to take off and land and launch the drone and fly it. Um, added to that, I have very limited flight time. Basically, that, that DJI Mavic Pro 2 has about a 20-minute flight time at the absolute maximum and limited battery life. And you don't want to exceed that because it falls out of the sky and you never see it again. And that's the end of $2,000 worth of kit. So um, you had to, the logistics of this, you had to plan your flights. You had to think very carefully about takeoff and landing. Uh, you had to think about the safety connotations. So all of that stuff fed into it. You really don't have that much time once you're up in the air to take the photos. So um, let's get to the photo project, which is really what I want to concentrate on. So I've called it Toxic Sublime. Conceptually, the photo project draws on this concept, uh, which has been popularized by uh, a US environmental scholar, Jennifer Peoples, University of Utah, who I've been corresponding with. Uh, and what she did in her academic work was to analyze a very famous Canadian photographer, Edward Batinsky, whose work you may well be familiar with. Uh, he's come to Australia recently, he has exhibitions all around the world. Uh, his, uh, his work is very much grand scale uh, photography, mostly taken from the air um, of big industrial sites, big iron ore mines in the Pilbara, um, massive Chinese factories, big waste sites in US feedlots. Uh, and he captures this grand scale of the industrial project. And Jennifer, um, in her analysis of Batinsky's work, hits upon this idea of the toxic sublime. And I'll, I'll come to explain what she means by that. But she basically contrasts it with two other trends in visual arts and visual photography. There's the natural sublime, which I've talked about at the opening, which is evident in the feelings of awe and wonder that we feel when we look at vast mountain peaks, waterfalls, storms, tornadoes. Um, and we feel shock and awe at the, the wonder of nature and its scale and its power and its magnitude. There's also the technical sublime uh, that we feel when we view images of massive human constructions or events. So, for instance, the, the archetypal images of the Chrysler building in New York or the Hoover Dam, massive industrial architecture, um, uh, or even the images of you know, Cape Canaveral of rockets blasting into space. And there's that feeling of sort of shock and awe that you feel when you see that. Jennifer Peoples' work uh, basically looks at Batinsky's uh, photographic genre and talks about this idea of the toxic of what's sublime. And what she's referring to here is the tension that we feel as people um, in recognizing the toxicity of a place, an object, or a situation, while simultaneously appreciating its mystery, its magnificence, and its ability to inspire awe. So this is one of the shots from my collection. It's called Poisoned Lake. And you can see it's quite a, a beautiful image, color-wise pattern com composition. But it's also, as we, we, we realize when we look at it, there's a duality here around the poison, the toxicity. You wouldn't really want to be wading around in that water down there. It's probably not very good for your health. So in this toxic sublime, there are tensions about what we feel when we view these images. And one of the main tensions is this curious paradox of viewing images which are both aesthetically beautiful, but also represent what we know are highly polluted and degraded environments. So in this image, which I've titled, Is There Life on Mars? Because it sort of looks like some sort of alien landscape. Um, basically, it's a top-down drone image taken above the Vales Point Collash Pond at Mannering Park in the late afternoon, which adds to the color. And you're struck by these vivid colors, which result from water coursing across the dumped ash and the toxins, the heavy metals, 
the chemical dust retardants, which are also applied, which produce these sorts of colours as well. Uh, and the image was, was taken, as I said, late in the day, late in the sunset, which adds that sort of vibrant orange colour. Uh, and so the theme is the tension between the aesthetic beauty and the knowledge of the pollution and the toxicity that recurs across the collection of these images. Although there are, as you'll see, they're quite varied in tone, in color and composition. So in complete contrast to that image, there's this one, which is one of my favorites, which I've called Coal Ash Blues, um, which is again, quite surreal aqua colors, a bit like that um, uh, little blue run image from Pennsylvania, isn't it? Um, in fact, the, the blue green tones actually extend up the dead tree that you can see there in the lower right hand side. Uh, and it's sort of, uh, again, a late afternoon so shot. You can see the shadow produced by the setting sun. This is again from Mannering Park on the central coast of New South Wales. Um, in fact, the nearby residents, and they live not far from here, probably 100 yards across the road from this where the shot was taken. Uh, the resident action group have charted the steady spread of the toxicity as the sort of the coal ash plume, the, the water residue seeps into the groundwater. And you can see the trees bordering this coal ash waste site are basically dying as the pond succumbs to the toxins that are leaching from 50 years of waste uh, on this site. So these images are viscerally beautiful. Um, you look at it and you think, oh gosh, that, that gorgeous colour. Um, but they're the product of a very ugly industrial process with very toxic consequences, which will last for generations because the, the, the toxins have leached into the wastewater, into the groundwater there. One other point I'll just make as a side point here is that um, you can see some little footprints there in the sort of mid right hand side. They're not people, those are kangaroo footprints. So there are a lot of kangaroos on this side um, bouncing around. Um, I never succeeded in getting, I had the wrong camera lens at the time to get an image of, of the kangaroos, but there are lots and lots on this site. Another tension that comes through in these images is a tension between magnitude and insignificance. It's about scale. There's an ambiguity of scale and orientation in a lot of these images, and that's, in a sense, deliberate on my part as a photographer. Um, so this image, a toxic river runs through it, which is a sort of a, a riff on uh, the famous book and movie, I think, A River Runs Through It. Um, we could be looking at micro patterns of sand on a beach or a shot from a satellite hundreds of kilometers above the earth. It's hard to tell where you are and what you're actually looking at here. In fact, this image is a stitched panorama. It's multiple shots in the drone stitched together. I'm flying at sort of max altitude around 120 meters here above um, a coal ash pond on the, in the upper Hunter. And the water courses here have carved out these patterns in the coal ash over time and the minerals in the coal ash residue have provided the varying color palette. And it's quite striking what you end up with. Uh, similar ambiguity of scale and orientation here in this image this is called boundary wall. Um, here you can see the man-made dimension much more clearly. I'm flying at much lower altitude around 30 meters here. Uh, and you can see the bulldozer tracks in the clay and the soil in the bottom mid of the photo. Uh, and that's caused uh, as a result of some uh, soil remediation. They're doing work here at this coal ash pond, pushing um, a layer of clay and soil above uh, the, the coal ash over time. And those bulldozer tracks sort of add to uh, the hint that of the scale of this site. You know, those are bulldozer tracks, but they look like sort of ant tracks in the soil. That tension of scale is also evident in the massive size of these coal ash dumps. They're often around 100 hectares in size. They're easily visible if you go on Google Maps, you can, you can see where they are. Uh, and that compares with the insignificance of the human scale. There are actually occasionally workers uh, working in protective gear on these sites, you'll sometimes see them, um, but really they are, these sites lack any sort of human um, evidence. So this is an image I've titled a not so distant land. It in fact, again, looks like a satellite image of a distant continent, you know, Greenland or Iceland or something. Um, but it's shot from the drone about 80 metres above the Araring uh, coal ash ponds. And so we've got this paradox again between humans creating these sites, these massive waste dumps, they dominate in terms of their material presence and sheer geographic scale, but they're actually peopleless places. Humans themselves are dwarfed by the scale, they're precluded from access, you're not allowed to go there um, because they're toxic and also because it's, I guess, fairly controversial. This is sort of the, the result of 50 years of coal fired power. 
The toxic sublime also stresses a contrast between the known and the unknown. Um, these toxic waste areas are known of, particularly by the communities that live nearby them and have to deal with the knowledge of toxic contamination in the air and the water. Uh, but they're also not known by the general public. Uh, in fact, people often express surprise when I discuss the topic of coal ash waste or the, the photo project that I'm doing. So just last night, I was at a book launch for the Wilderness Society, and I mentioned I was doing this talk tomorrow on drone photography of coal ash waste. And they said, what are coal ash ponds? What's that? And I started to show them the images on my phone. And they went, oh, wow. And these were people who were you know, well-schooled in environmental politics and, and environmental issues. And they're quite surprised when they, they saw these images. So these sites are deliberately hidden from public view um, by what was the, the former sort of New South Wales State Electricity Commission now by the companies that, that run these coal-fired power stations. Um, they produce a lot of waste. They are excluded there in terms of exclusion zones. There's private roads, there's security fences, there's monitoring with, I guess, good reason. You don't want the general public wandering in there unknowing. Um, they're toxic sites, but they're also controversial because this is the result of fossil energy in an era of worsening climate crisis. Uh, there's a similar strategy of seeking to hide the visual blight of fossil fuel extraction, obviously, in the massive coal mines that exist in the Upper Hunter Valley. Uh, and I'm always struck by how hard it is to actually see those massive um, open cut coal mines, um, you know, the Glencore mine up at Ravensworth and others. You've got a big highway that runs right through the middle of them, but they're hidden by these massive berms and trees. It's actually very difficult to get, get a visual glimpse of those massive holes in the ground that are producing um, the, the thermal coal that is exported through Newcastle, which contributes to Australia as one of the world's largest exporters of, of coal to the world. Um, finally, the toxic sublime brings to the fore this tension between security and risk. So these are aerial vistas, they're aerial photographs. Um, they're taken high above, remotely by a drone. I'm looking at my, my, um, my controller on my phone as I'm taking these images. The drone's way up there over the, over the land. So it's safe for me, it's safe for the viewer. Um, there's knowledge in that safety. We can safely consume these images knowing that we're not out there on the toxic waste site. Um, but they remind us of this strange fascination that we have in experiencing uh, toxic or dangerous sites. We're fascinated by the visual images. I'm, I'm reminded, having just seen the film Oppenheimer, I'm reminded of the fascination of seeing the visual images of the toxic of the uh, the nuclear tests or the nuclear bomb blasts. Um, there is a, a shock and awe in watching the atomic bomb explosion, the scale of it, the, the colours. Uh, and there's also a horror in observing those images as well. And it's sort of analogous, I guess, to these sort of urban wastelands. Um, the images you well might have seen of um, those communities in proximity to the Chernobyl nuclear disaster and how those, those cities were evacuated over a day and now they're, they're waste sites. And there is a sort of a, a bizarre fascination of observing the aesthetics and the drama and the spectacle of these, of these images. To some extent, and I don't really compare these images to those, but there is a similar, sir, sir, similar certain sort of paradox here uh, of um, watching the aesthetics of these images, but being aware of um, the horror and the toxicity and the pollution, etc., whatever the context might be, that's behind these images. We're relieved not being there physically, but we sort of experience these things at a distance. So this shot's called Aqualite at Dusk. It's another one of these really aesthetically quite pleasing images, but uh, knowing what the subject matter is behind it, you wouldn't really want to be standing there at sunset. In terms of exhibiting the collection, um, I'm still, this is work in progress. I'm still processing and developing numbers of images. These are three images from the same um, shoot, actually, in the Upper Hunter, uh, Greenpool, Gin of the Wasteland, and Peppermint Ash. And the reason I put these three together was there was a there's a toxic algal bloom there, blue-green algal bloom, and it adds another sort of color to the palette of, of the images. Um, comp composition here, I'm, I'm basically making decisions about how high I fly the drone and what I'm trying to capture in the frame. It's very difficult because I have a very tight time window to take these shots. Um, so the left and right images are shot at relatively low altitudes, that's sort of 40 meters. The middle image is a composite shot, again, shot at maximum altitude to give you this massive um, sort of pulled back vision of this, this bizarre sort of 
uh, I've called it a genus, sort of like a genie emerging from the wasteland of, of the coal ash. Uh, if you want to view the, the, the complete collection at the moment, as it is, that's, it's on my photography website, and there's a hyperlink there that'll take you to that, and I'm happy to share that in the chat, and you can, you can view them at your leisure. They're quite spectacular when you view them on a big screen. Um, I've also given some thought to how they might be exhibited. Here's some images, mock-ups of what they might look like in an exhibition space, sort of grouped by uh, colour palette and composition and those sorts of things. Um, just to give you an idea. I think they look quite attractive actually on the wall um, and they work quite well. And perhaps down the track, I will exhibit them somewhere um, and people can see them at scale. I'd like to blow some of these images up really, really big. And I think they'd be quite interesting to see on a, at a big physical scale. Lastly, I guess, just I'm going to finish up in a second. There's the issue of whether to expand the collection of what new photo projects I could do on the subject of fossil energy and the climate crisis more generally. One area I'm expanding is my photography of the actual industrial sites themselves and the, the coal-fired power plants. Um, particularly as these, these plants, many of them are closing down and being replaced by renewable energy technologies. So recently uh, I've been taking photos of the aging coal-fired power fleet of generators. Um, and that might form part of another collection or a larger collection on the history of coal-fired electricity. And this includes quite artistic takes, I think, on the aesthetics of industrial technology and the confluence of the technical and the, the toxic sublime. So here's some examples. These haven't been seen by anybody apart from the company that gave me access. Um, and they're, they're pretty out there, I think you'll agree in terms of color. Um, the shot on the left-hand side is Liddell, which is closed and they've had some artists in there, hence the, the colored paint that has been uh, um, applied to some of the pipe work there. Um, the right shot is a Bayswater power station, which is still operating. So this is an operating coal. Um, five power plant, massive sort of um, pieces of machinery here that, that crush the coal to ash before it's combusted in the boiler rooms. Um, and two final shots, again on the right, Liddell, this is looking into the heart of the beast. This is the looking into the boiler. Um, this is nine stories up and you can see all the massive copper piping there. Um, and I'm basically, they've opened the door, it's no longer burning. So you wouldn't be able to do this with an operating coal fired power station, but it's been closed for many months. They've opened the door and you can look into the boiler room and take this shot with these arrays of copper pipes. And on the, the right is a shot of one of the four massive uh, cooling towers at um, Bayswater Power Station. And again, that's from the ground level with a wide angle uh, lens and it gives you a sort of sense of the scale. These things are massive. Um, I can't remember how high they are, but they are huge. So that's that's another sort of photography project I might develop down the track. So I'm not sure where this all goes. Um, one option would be a broader visual project than fossil energy in Australia, something I'm keen to explore, but that would require um, the, the approval and the access of the companies involved and some negotiation there. So there's, there's issues to be explored. But look, thanks very much for the time to present this. And I'll be really interested to hear on your, your responses, reflections, comments, questions, et cetera. But thanks again for sparing the time to listen to this. Thank you so much, Chris. That is fantastic. Can I just say at a personal level, I think your images are technically and visually spectacular. Um, so putting aside for a moment the horror show of what you're actually depicting, but thank you for doing it. And I think it's really important that we share and promote these images much more widely. That's my own personal response. Um, there are actually a number of questions from folks, um, a little bit more about the kind of machinations of the work rather than the art aspect, but I'm sure we'll come to that as the conversation continues. Um, so Linda has asked, I'm just gonna go in the order that the questions came in folks. Uh, so Linda has asked, um, industries should have to include ongoing cleanup and eventual site remediation as part of their business plan, don't they? Uh, but I assume they don't. And I know there's also some other folks who I'll mention in a moment, they're part of community groups that are trying to get governments and such to do the cleanups. But Chris, what are your first thoughts on, you know, I think we all know that there's a mine site rehabilitation obligation, but we also know, isn't it like 80,000 abandoned mine sites in Australia, something crazy like that? Yeah, um, it, it boggles the mind when you think about what would be required to meaningfully um, return these parts of the planet to something close to what they were before. Um, we have a, a real problem of governance, really, and, and politics, and it relates to climate change more generally and emissions that um, 
in the rush of the 90s, I think, the privatization, corporatization and privatization of, of, of coal-fired power generation, um, these, these assets were, were sold off, um, often quite cheap, to private companies um, who were keen to who could see the profitability in the short term. Um, but it comes with this long-term effect of what do you do in terms of remediation. Now, I can't really talk too specifically about specific companies here, but... Um, you know, this is a huge problem. And I think some of some companies are actually thinking about this and, and what they could do. Um, coal ash can be used uh, as a waste product that can feed into building products like cement and building products. And so there is the potential, some sort of semi-circular economy type stuff there. Um, the problem again is we really need industry policy to drive a lot of it. We need government to drive the direction of the change. We can't just leave it to, to market forces and companies to do these things because it, it won't be coordinated. And that's the problem with climate change more generally with emissions mitigation as well, that governments have just stepped back in an era of decades of neoliberalism. So let's just leave it to markets and companies to solve these problems. And it's just not going to happen. You need government to drive that direction. And that relates to emissions. It also relates to cleaning up these sites. Um, so you could see how it could happen, but it requires that involvement of the state to drive that change. And both sides of the major political parties have no appetite, it seems, for that. No, thank you, Chris. And I might just jump. Um, Sheena has a question about the actual uh, tasks of uh, drone footage. I might come back to that, but just picking up on what you've said, I want to read what Kim Grierson has said. She says, uh, Kim here from our, I'm sorry if I pronounce it wrong, Awaba, Awaba country. I'm a mm. member of the Coal Ash Community Alliance and the Community Consultative Committee for Eraring Power Station. Neither the company nor the New South Wales government have any intention of cleaning up the huge coal ash dump at Eraring. It'll only be people power that might change their view. One of the big problems for residents is the lack of appropriately sited monitors and the companies monitor their pollution themselves. So that's um, obviously the monitoring issue is, oh, it's just so depressing, yeah. bizarre. Yeah, and, and, and hats off to all the local community groups who have been fighting this for decades, because um, I'm a newbie to all of this. Um, and I'm aware uh, of some of the work that's been done, but yeah, you're fighting sort of David and Goliath battle here because mm -hmm. it's like, it, it is an inconvenient truth. It's one of these elephants in the room we don't want to talk about. There's this massive toxic waste problem that has yeah. been allowed to build for decades and nobody wants to touch it. Yeah, and it does get lost. Like, actually, a lot of environmental issues at the moment are getting lost in the absolutely legitimate, urgent need to switch away from coal. But um, we are being left with this legacy of destruction across our continent. Um, thank you for sharing that, Kim. Um, actually, I didn't copy into my questions because it was a comment, but Gary also mentioned another group, Future Sooner, who are another group involved. I'll go back to that comment in a moment. Um, but Sheena from BirdLife Australia. Hello, Sheena. Sheena says, um, is there any move by industry to stop drone use from gathering footage over their industrial footprints like aerial trespass? Uh, this seems like an interesting issue. Yeah, look, I would strongly suspect that's the case um i didn't um i didn't have approval necessary to fly over some of these sites but i think at law they don't control the air above the site um there there are i think legitimate concerns from companies around drone use particularly where they're using explosives and things at mine sites i could see how that could be a real problem if you've got a wi-fi um operated device and yeah, clearly there are lots of signs up now around drones not allowed over over, over coal mines. I'm I'm imagining that will be a short time before that's the case for these sites as well. Um, generally, flying drones is not fun because there's just more and more re restrictions on what you can do a bit with them and where you can fly them. And a lot of that is quite legitimate. You know, you don't want to be flying them anywhere near um, flight paths and things. And there's all sorts of apps which tell you where you can and can't fly. Um, added to that. Uh, just in terms of, you know, the restrictions of their use, which I imagine will just increase. There's, there's proposals to bring in stuff around um, automatic ID of drones. Um, so the older drones don't have that. So I actually don't fly a drone very much. <laughs> um, uh, this is a rare opportunity where I've used one, um, but they're a hassle. Um, they're a real hassle to, to use. And um, I can just in the in the very near future imagine that they'll be more and more outlawed and prohibited. So that raises a real issue. So then you, you're looking for aerial photography. You're looking at you know hiring a uh, a charter plane and getting up there, which isn't cheap. Um, and um, yeah, so that's 
That's my response. I'm ambivalent about drones. I can understand why people are concerned about them and things, but on the other hand, they are a very useful tool to capture a very different perspective on, on the landscape. Mm, no, thank you, Chris. Just going through the questions. Um, Mary has said, uh, mining industry in Australia is apparently 86% foreign owned. Not sure about that fact, um, but can you relate foreign ownership to creative self-destruction? Um, I wonder if her question pertains to the notion that the more foreign ownership you have, the less care and concern for the local ecosystem or people. Yeah, um, so in terms of uh, uh, coal and mineral mining, um, there are some very well-known large multinational mining companies that dominate the market. Um, and uh, there's a sort of an argument, I guess, around whether foreign ownership makes those companies more or less environmentally aware or concerned. Certainly the, the big multinational companies, the BHPs, the Rios, the Glencores, uh, Anglo-Americans, they're big, sophisticated companies. And they, when they screw up, whether it's in Brazil or Australia or wherever it is, they are aware of the massive outcry that causes. So it doesn't mean they're not going to um, uh, have disasters, oil spills, um, tailings, dams collapsing, whatever. Uh, but uh, my interactions with them, they are pretty sophisticated on health and safety and environmental regulation because they're aware of the potential pushback regulatory and reputational risks that occur there. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, you can, I have to be careful what I say, I guess, here, but you can think of Australian owned coal companies that are probably as bad or worse than some of the overseas ones. I'm not sure there's a causal connection between foreign ownership and domestic ownership there in terms of their environmental unfriendliness. Um, yeah. Mm. Thanks, Chris. Oh, just a couple of relevant comments. Uh, Bernie has said Latrobe Valley Promo Community Forum. The EPA asked about the EPA was asked about chemical monitoring, but it's all privatised. And if they want further work, their reports need to be favourable. There's no audit by EPA. Um, so anyway, so I think we've touched on some of the bigger issues around the actual rehabilitation and care for these sites. Um, there was one other question. I'm not quite sure if I understand it, but I will try my best. Mary's asked, I am curious, how have coal-powered economies or firms tried to capture what they consider the most significant images? Any studies that compare, for example, steel in the US um, or activities in Brazil, etc. I'm not sure I understand that question. Chris, do you? Uh, well, I, I guess I could respond. I mean, there is... Um... It's interesting when you look at visual imagery and sustainability reports of companies you see and websites see these marvellous glossy images um, of their operations and things. And um, there's, there's, I guess there's a whole industry in public relations and marketing where you're trying to create uh, an appealing, presentable image to the public of what it is that you do. I was just looking at the website of um, Tambrin Resources, which are the ones who are doing the fracking up in the Beetaloo. And I was quite surprised that their website has drone in visual video image of one of the big fracking pads, um, which is, I was surprised because I thought on the one hand, it's sort of celebrating the technical mastery of this piece of infrastructure, which is fracking the ground and destroying and the water courses and things. But on the other hand, it could be interpreted actually as, as um, by environmentalists as a um, quite a negative piece of imagery and that's on their website. So how visual images are interpreted by different audiences, I think, is a really interesting perspective to think about. And we can look at, um, you know, massive images of, of big dams, you know, those those archetypal images from Tasmania of, 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 of Pedder and stuff. And on the one hand, perhaps the, the hydro companies at the time thought these were quite heroic images of their of their success in taming nature on the other environmentalists would look at it with horror at what they've done to um, Lake Petter before it was flooded. So yeah, these things can be interpreted in different sorts of ways, I think. Yeah, and in fact, that relates to a really great question that's come in. Um, thank you for your presentation, Chris. Your work is unique and amazing, well thought through and fantastically executed. I was wondering what's your view, and I'll hope to pronounce this word correctly. I have a law degree, but this is a hard word. What's your view on the aesthetic Aesthetication of destruction, so the making beautiful images of destruction or something like that, as it is a very different approach to use saturated car colours and aerial shots um, that traditionally have been used to depict untouched nature, whereas the destruction is often depicted as daunting with black and white imagery shot from a low angle to depict a daunting and intimidating image. Thank you. Great question. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And I'm, I'm battling with this issue myself. Um, 
I think there, again, there's various ways you can go. You'll, you'll have realised in my images, I've gone with the former. It, it is aestheticised, I guess, in terms of colour and composition and pattern. And the thinking there was to um, uh, highlight this contradiction that people see these images and they think, oh, my gosh, that's attractive, that's Lake Eyre or something. And then you get you hook them in. They sort of go, oh, wow, I'm, I'm aesthetically engaged with this image. And then you explain to them in the text or the thing at the side or whatever, actually, this is a this is a toxic waste site. So it's sort of like a, a one-two punch sort of thing. You, you suck the person in and then you hook them with the, this is what it's actually from. And that, I think, is what is behind Batinsky's work. And there's a number of others. I'm, I'm looking at the books below me. I've forgotten all the names now of these US photographers who get up in Cessnas and photograph these massive feedlots or um, these, these chemical waste sites. And you're struck by how beautiful they are, this vibrant yellow imagery with a sort of shot of red blood through the middle. And then it's explained what it is. It's this perfectly unnatural industrial process. So I can sort of get how that is a useful form of communication, whereas the contrast would be the sort of the, the, the almost cliched sort of destructive image, and I've done these myself, telephoto lenses of coal-fired power stations, desaturate them, shoot them on an overcast day, ramp up the contrast, and they look black and dark and ominous, the classic dark satanic mills sort of image. And they can be effective too, but they have almost become a cliche, I think, to some extent. And people sort of almost switch off when they see those sort of things. So I'm not convinced either way. I think both have, have purpose. Um, and it's really, I guess, the sort of the message and the and the, the genre you're sort of trying to reach for there. Mm. No, thank you, Chris. And um, after 35 years and sort of looking at the environmental world myself, I couldn't agree more. I think there's a space for all of the different kinds of ways of depicting what we should be aware of. Um, but I do, I really do feel that depicting these kinds of images in a startlingly attractive way, it certainly caught my attention more than the usual this is bad, look at that, that's bad. It's made me look with new eyes. I want to go back and see why are they blue? Why are they so ash? You know, so there's a curiosity there. Perhaps that's also because I don't know a lot about the topic, which makes me feel terrible given we have folks in, on this call today who are community members battling it out directly. So um, much love and appreciation to all of you. Um, Ingrid has got a fantastic question or comment and it connects me very much to some things I'd like to say before we wrap up. Um, Ingrid says, I do love your approach. You've put that word in again, Ingrid. I do love your approach to aesthetificate the, the big A word. I love your approach. Would love to combine it with community organisation workshops we're running. Would you be interested in such a collaboration? And I wanted to say that I think your work, Chris, would be just so valuable for lots of different angles and communities who are battling it out or trying to make people aware or governments aware of what's happening and to be able to see this work in a different light the way you present it could could be and it's your business what you do with your time but could be a brilliant way to share so um <clears throat> I don't know Chris if you'd like to pop your email in the chat or not I don't want to put you on the spot um, but if anyone wants to get in touch with you then I'll leave that up to you but certainly and this is where I just wanted to give a little plug um and an invitation to you Chris uh, uh, Ayla has an earth arts program that we've run well, as, as long as Ayla's been around, it's a small, humble offering. We have a whole website called um, the Earth Arts, you know, Ayla Earth Arts. And what we're interested in is how we nurture the role of human creativity in transforming law and governance. And one invitation to you, Chris, is whether you would join us on our website or whether you would value having your own virtual gallery. It's something one of our tech team could help you with. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to eartharts.org.au, you'll see that every two years, well, particularly since COVID, we started having a virtual gallery and it's a fantastic way to, to showcase artists' work. Uh, we also have, um, every two years, we have different exhibitions and ideas and things that bring together. And we've got an anthology where people share stories and poetry. Uh, we've got a visual arts and a sound and acoustic ecology stream where lovely people like Andrew Skiok, who's a legend, um, comes and shares their work and tells people about it. So two things, Chris, just wanted to let you know that the earth arts space is always able to show people's work through a virtual um, gallery if you can't be bothered with the hard work yourself. And it helps people set up work, really showcase their material in a way that never has to incur much of a cost. Um, and I'll get out of there now. But I just want to let everybody know that next year, Ayla will be kicking off another kind of round of different artistic expressions of our connection to place, our care for place. But also if you need, because um, you're saying, you know, you want to put your photos in an exhibition uh, as a holding space, you know, you could always mm -hmm. have 
uh, your own virtual gallery. Those plugins on websites are really handy once you work them out. Yeah, look, I'd be happy to do both of those. Um, definitely yeah. be keen to sort of work with community groups and happy to travel and print the photos out and show them and all that stuff. And also yeah. on your um, virtual website, they're great too. Because I think yeah. the problem is you t you spend all this time, you create these photos and yeah. nobody sees them. So it's always good to get it out there and have people see this stuff. So Yeah, yeah. no, that's exactly right, Chris. It's not casting any aspersions on your ability to promote your own work. It's more if we all pitch in together and cross yeah. over and find ways to share and communicate, I think more people can become aware of stuff. So um, Sarah's just put Chris's website into, um, I love the name of it, Smug Mug, uh, Christopher, <laughs> into the link there. Um, for anyone who is wanting to look more at Chris's work, please visit his website. And um, yeah, we would love to connect with any of you. Ingrid, thank you for your, we would, anyone who's doing arts related work individually or as communities, please get in touch. Um, as I say, we are small and humble. We don't have any money to speak of, but we've got lots of people who would love to cross pollinate with ideas and, and beautiful and ugly images that raise attention. But on that note, I'm going to say a huge thank you to Chris. I've thoroughly enjoyed this talk and I can't wait to go over your photos in more detail. A huge thank you to everyone who's joined us today and might be watching on the recording. Um, and yeah, just some final words from you, Chris, if you want to plug anything that you're doing, uh, any other work that what's coming up next, I guess, is a good way to plug what you're doing next. Uh, well, yeah, I, I think I signaled that at the end. I'm, I'm looking at maybe doing some more work on the, the infrastructure. The other thing we've got going is we're doing a, an ARC project on climate adaptation in different industries. And so one in one industry sector I've spent many years interviewing people and taking photos is the Great Barrier Reef and the marine tourism industry and coral bleaching. And um, looks like we've probably unfortunately got another bleaching event coming this February, March, given sea surface temperatures. Uh, see Terry Hughes has been tweeting about it on Twitter. Um, so yeah, you'll probably see some images of um, the reef and tear operators and bleach coral and hopefully not bleach coral in the future. So that's another thing I'm doing. Mm. Wonderful. And could I urge you, Chris, to if there are any any of the folks out there who are trying to plant the little baby corals that will be more resilient to the heat, please include them in your gallery exhibitions. I've read about them and I'd love to know more. I just think that's one of the most honourable things a human being could be doing at this point in time. Anyway, I digress. Chris, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you for sharing your work. I know how bloody busy you are and all the different things you do. Um, and please keep it up. I think raising the awareness and taking these images um, really is showcasing information that people need to see. So thank you, everybody. And we'll see you hopefully on Monday. Please join us for Dr. Dimity, who's going to talk about how Western medicine's finally catching up and prescribing nature. How clever is that, finally? Thank you, Chris. Have a great day. Pleasure. All the best, guys. Bye.